All right, everyone, welcome back to class. I have to admit, I don't know what day it is anymore because <laughs> I'm actually just now writing that first test of yours, so my mind's a little bit blown. Plus, I've got some really cool videos I'm going to show you today, but it took me a long time to make them, nearly three days. So forgive me if I don't know if today is Wednesday or Friday. I'll look it up when I go back to the, to the office. I also wasn't able to think of any funny jokes. I, I'm sure I'll come up with some video funny thing at some point, but not today. I swear it took me three, the, the little snippets I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you one here in a minute, took me three days to make, so I'm, I'm kind of out of it. Anyway, all right, back to task. Uh, let's review a little bit, which is, let's see, in, in the relatively recent history, we've gone over the particle in a box, we beat that to death, did a bunch of, um, of like uncertainty principle calculations, especially on your homework, which I'm sure is very unpleasant. Uh, then we talked about the finite box and how it's, you're starting to see how we can use quantum mechanics to, to demonstrate bonding. That one I know is a little unsatisfying because, again, the algebra of solving the wave functions from the boundary conditions it's pretty onerous, and if you look at the handout I have that does that, you can see it's, it's about two pages of algebra. I don't want to do that in class. That's, that's just a little too much. However, we can do some model problems. We're going to do this one, and some homework problems that are also kind of on the easier side uh, than the finite box. And what I introduced last time was the infinite step potential. Okay, so you can see it's like, half, it's like the right half of the finite box, right? So, uh, this one we can solve. Now, according to what I said last time, is that what we've got is we've got a universe that's one dimensional, and there's one particle in it, and there's a step in the potential surface, right? So, the great turkey that created this place, that's what was created, and it all starts, their, their big bang is to take this particle and throw it at the wall which is why we begin with an A wave, that's a right moving wave, and um, it's going to hit the wall, and it may or may not go through. Of course, if it goes through, it's going to keep moving to the right, so that's a C wave. Uh, the B is a reflection. The B wave is a reflection, so even the minus 5K1X. Of course, there's, uh, there, there's a certain momentum, right? Remember, the Ks are, are represent the momentum. Um, they are the... Uh, what are they? Wave vectors, right? So, uh, also called momentum vectors. So, we've got our typical square root of 2me over h bar, the, the thing we've been seeing literally since the first day that we started on quantum. And there's a different k for region 2, k2 in region 2. And that's because we have to shave some energy off because of the step potential. Okay, so this is the setup. And now, now I can show you because. <laughs> I, I don't know how many of you did look at that handout for the, for the finite box, but because it's onerous and you didn't, that's fine. We are going to do that. Um, we're we're going to solve for A, B, and C, and K1 and K2. We're going to solve for all that today. So I'll show you how to do that. Uh, but you know, what I wanted to do is, you know, I, I look at this and I realize it may be kind of hard to really get what I'm talking about. And that's why I, I, I spent a few, as I mentioned, a few days making some videos. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that. Uh, again, you, you know, you've heard me complain a zillion times. You're going to see the video here. I'm going to watch it over there so I can kind of keep track because I'm looking at an empty board. Let me explain what I'm doing. I've modeled the problem, this, this infinite step problem, on a computer. What did I model? What I've got here initially, and you'll see it in a minute, I'm not, I'm not drawing it yet, uh, on the right of the barrier is a wave function. It looks kind of like a particle in a box wave function. So it's to the right of the barrier. Now, you know that particle in a box wave functions are, uh, we, can, we can think of them as being sum of momentum waves. So that's what I did. What I did was I make this particle in a box looking wave function by summing up a bunch of momentum waves. And I used only e to the ikx, not minus ikx. Now what that means is, is that it's going to move to the right. It's going to hit the barrier, and what you're going to see is you're going to see it reflect or transmit. I've done this for two different barrier heights. I, now I know the energy of this because I can calculate it from here. 
I know the energy and I set the potential. There, there's two of them. There's, uh, there's a potential energy that is greater than the energy and then there's a potential that is less than the energy. Uh, and, and I've scaled them appropriately. Okay, so that's the setup. A wave is going to hit a barrier. You're going to see two of them. I think I have the higher energy one. I have the higher energy one um, on top and the lower energy one on bottom. So, so okay. So now that you're seeing that, and sorry, I have to, I have to, uh, I have to watch it over here. Okay. Now, notice the first thing you're seeing. And again, the higher energy steps on top in red. Notice that you're seeing how it's spreading out, and, and I'm also scaling the y-axis. That's why it's like expanding. I have to scale the y-axis because the wave function um, it loses some height and it broadens, and it broadens because some of the waves are, are faster than others. Remember, there's a whole bunch of K waves. And now what you already see happening is, you can see that the one on top, you see it get all wiggly. There's a little bit of penetration. You can see a little bit of a bump gets through the barrier, but not too much, and, and it doesn't last. And maybe you, you can't even see it. I can barely see it. Now, on the bottom, with the lower barrier, the, the barrier that's slightly lower than the energy, you can see the wave get through. Now, notice another cool thing is that that blue wave, the, the one that escapes to the right, uh, that one is less wavy, right? It, it's, in fact, if I was to, it's hard to describe these with a the wavelength, but I would definitely describe the wave that got through the barrier as having a longer wavelength. And the barrier, and the wave that doesn't get through, the, the, like the B wave, the reflection wave, has a lot of wiggles to it, and that means that it has higher kinetic energy. So again, you can see what I mean by reflection and transmission. With a high barrier, the wave basically gets stuck, and it, it can't really penetrate it at all, maybe a little bit. On the bottom, you see the lower uh, potential, and the wave does pass through. Again, it's a little hard to say what the wavelength is, but definitely the part that gets through the barrier, the part that gets through the barrier, I hope I'm doing this right. That one, uh, that one, if I was to describe it with a wavelength, I would say that it has a longer wavelength. And that means that it has less kinetic energy, but of course it does. Because it's gone through this, it's in this high potential energy area, so it, it can't have as much kinetic energy. Uh, energy is potential plus kinetic. It has to shave some of that total energy off due to potential energy, so it has less kinetic energy, and therefore it appears to have a longer wavelength. Okay, so I hope that was, I hope it looked kind of cool for one, and, and there you go. I hope you can visualize what it means for this quantum entity to like come at and get reflected or transmit through a barrier. Now, it's not quite the same, so now let's solve the problem here. Now that you have, I hope, uh, I hope a better feel for this, this isn't quite the same problem because now remember that when I drew that it looked like a particle in a box wave function, it was, it, it, this isn't right, either the IKX, either the minus IKX, that's not the same thing, right? I, I am using simpler math models here because I have to because I can't really solve what I'm about to solve unless I did that. Now recall that again, my particle in a box was actually a sum of several of these and that's how I can make it localize the way it did. So anyway, and if that kind of just shut over your head, don't worry about it. Cool video, now let's do the solution. All right, now what I showed you last time is that you're gonna wanna, uh, you have, you're gonna have to do the boundary conditions and you have to do the continuous and smooth boundary conditions at the, at the boundary. And here we have one boundary at x equals zero. Okay, now you may recall that I mentioned to you that there's a bit of a shortcut and that is to do the smooth boundary condition and divide it by the continuous boundary condition. That's called a, it's like the log derivatives. We're going to set the log derivatives of wave function 1 and 2 equal at x equals 0. Now again, I've got that shot over some of your head, so let me just write it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write for region 1 at x equals uh, 0, I'm going to set that equal to the derivative of the wave function at x equals 0. Uh, the derivative of, of the wave function at x equals 2, and then I'm going to divide that by the wave function. Right? It's a derivative on top, wave function on bottom. So remember that the derivative of x divided by x is, is the change in the natural law, right? That's a standard calc identity, standard calculus identity. I, I hope you remember that. I think we've even seen that a couple of times in this class already. 
Okay, so I'm gonna just try to do, <laughs> I'm gonna just try to do this up here. I mean, may not be the smartest thing to do. And and again, remember that what I'm doing here is I have I have some unknowns and I need to be able to solve for them. Uh, a plus B is one. A minus B is minus one, right? So then you can solve A and B. And that's basically what we're doing here. That's the big picture. All right. Now I said that this is a good way to start, so let's do that. Uh, the derivative is i k one a e to the zero is just a. Uh, then I've got minus i k one uh, b to the b e to the zero is just b is equal to i k two uh, c e to the zero is c. Right, right, not too bad. Okay. Then I derive. Then I, sorry. Blah, blah, then I divide it by. Uh, the wave function at x equals zero on region one, and that's just a plus b, right? See, I told you that this actually this is like way easier. And then region two at x equals zero is just c. Okay, so then I'm going to work with this. So you see, I've already eliminated. I can um, I can get rid of the i's. Sorry to do it this way. I try not to do things this way, but it's it's too tempting. Okay, so so what? Actually, I have to take a little bit of a breather here and think. Okay, cool. I, I can do a bunch of algebra, but to what end? What do I really want to do with this? See, I haven't really described that yet. I probably should have. But think about that video I just saw. Take the, the one on bottom, the, the one where the barrier wasn't too high. Some of the wave function passed through, and then some of it got reflected. The only thing I think that would be of interest is to figure out how much, how much went through and how much, you know, bounced off. That's really the only meaningful metric for what this model does. I mean, there's no other question that could really ask, is there? Okay, so what would that be? So looking at this, and knowing that, uh, uh, now, now remember, we, I, I've had you do this a couple of times, on your homework, uh, either the ikx or either the um, minus ikx, it doesn't matter. Remember that a wave, the absolute value of a wave function, which is the probability density, this ends up being e to the zero, which is one. And what that means is, is that the amplitude of the wave coming to the right is just a. This, this e doesn't do anything. And the, the magnitude that is reflected is just b. So the magnitude of the oncoming wave is A, and the magnitude of the reflected wave is B. And therefore, I would say the percent reflection is just going to be uh, B over A. Right? Not quite. This, remember, probabilities are absolute value squared. So I've got to, I've got to do this. Okay, the absolute value of uh, B over the absolute value of A. Uh, actually, you know what, there's a shortcut. Uh, you can just verify this, just plug in some numbers in your calculator. You can just take the ratio and just take the absolute value of the ratio. Okay, so and remember that only wave functions squared have physical meaning. The wave function itself, it, we're not sure what it is. It, it only means something when it's, when you're looking at the absolute value. And that, you know, when it's the absolute value, then you've got a probability density. Okay, so so this gives me a guide what to do with this. I can see again that the only meaningful characterization, the, the only thing this model can tell me of interest is how much of the wave gets reflected. And that's B over A. So what I'm doing with this is what I want to do is I want to solve B over A. Okay, so K1A minus K1B is equal to K2A plus K2. And it looks a little daunting, but actually it's, it's like stupid easy. What you've got is K2 minus K1 B. Um, no, 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 that's minus. Yeah, is that right? I've got, um, I bring K2. Yeah, I bring K2 over. And then I've got K2 minus K1 A on the other side. Is that right? I feel like I made a, like I made a silly mistake. Have I made a mistake? Let's see here. Um, uh, no, it doesn't look like it. Okay, so therefore B. Uh, 
uh, e over a is k2 minus k1 over k2 plus k1. And it's a little odd that uh, I have the minus sign. I feel like um, um, oh, well, 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 well. yeah, I've got a minus sign. I've got a minus sign, but you know what I can do with that? I got a minus sign uh, from up here. So I can I can say that that's k1. Sorry, I was freaking out because I wasn't uh, I mean, I know the answer in my head, so <laughs> the minus sign threw me off. Okay, now this is correct. So, so again, I've done my algebra correct, and, and I've done that in a fairly small number of steps, and, I, and that was assisted by the fact that I used the log, setting the log derivatives equal, like what you just saw. Okay, so b over a is uh, k1 minus k2 over k1 plus k2. It sounds nice, right? It has some symmetry to it. And therefore, uh, the percent reflection is, of course, going to be the absolute value of k1 minus k2 over k1 plus k2. Okay. Now, what do I do with that? And so that, that's the answer. What I can do with this is, knowing my definitions of k1 and k2, what I could do is I could uh, just do some, some graphing, use the same software I made down in the video, and I could say, for an electron, I'll, I'll pick the mass of an electron. Okay, that's easy. And then I'll just decide on like a potential energy, like 1 eV. And then I'll look at the reflection as I change the energy from 0 to like maybe like from 1 to 2 eV. And, um, and yeah, there you go. So I've got the mass defined. I'll make the energy go from like 0 to 2 eV. And I'll weigh that against a potential energy of 1 eV. And with that, I'll figure out the k's, and then I plug it into there to get the uh, percent reflection. You're going to do a little bit of that on your homework, so I'm not, I don't want to say too much about that. Okay, so what does that look like? Um, let's see here. Now, the thing that got brought up at the, towards the end of last lecture, and you may notice that from k2, here, let's look at k2. This got brought up at the end of last lecture. We're going to have to be careful uh, how, we, how we do this, as much as it sounds straightforward. When I plug in numbers in my calculator, i got to pay attention to the fact that when e is less than v, then I've got the square root of a negative number, right? And that means that I've got, uh, I've got um, an imaginary k. If e is greater than v, then everything's OK. Now, what that means is that when I make my graphs, I've got to have, I've got to do the calculation for E minus V, uh, for, for energy less than V, and I've got to do that one way, and again, you're going to do that on your homework, but when E is greater than V, then I do it a different way, that it's actually a little bit easier to do it that way. Okay, just heads up that this one calculation is actually two. So here's what I mean by that. All right, so let's do, let, let's go from low energy to high energy, because that makes sense although it's actually a little bit more complicated. Uh, the energy is less than V, it's slightly more complicated. And again, the reason is, for all the reasons I talked about last time, K2 is going to be imaginary. So the way I described that last time, because E is less than V, what I do is I just take that minus sign, and then I switch E and V. Right. So E minus V is minus V minus E. <laughs> I hope I said that right. Okay, so that's our that's our, like our new version of K2. And if that's the case, then the wave function in region two is um, is going to be e to the minus k2x, right? It's just an exponential decay. Okay, and what does that look like? It's gonna look like this. So I'm assuming that the A wave is just some kind of wave, and what's gonna happen is it's gonna it's gonna be wavy. Um, sorry, I have to I have to really think about this. So it's, it's wavy, and then it hits the barrier, and then it just decays off, right? Just a little exponential decay. So that's, that's what it does. And if this is the case, then the um, percent reflection 
the percent reflection is going to be 100%. Now this is, a, as I mentioned, you're going to be doing some of this on your homework. This is a homework question, so I can't say too much about it, but let me give you a little bit of a hint. Okay, so you're going to prove that the percent reflection is 100%. Remember, the mathematical language for 100% is the number one. Okay, the way you do that is to note that, I'll just set you up. You've got K1 my, right, minus IK2 over K1 plus IK2. Okay, now it turns out it doesn't matter what K1 and K2 are so long as E is less than V0, as long as your energy is smaller than the step. When that's the case, K2 is imaginary. Okay, as long as you're working with that, it doesn't matter what K1 and K2 are, uh, because now what you do is you, to, to solve this, you're going to take the complex conjugate, which means that you put a minus sign in front of the I times the non-complex conjugate. Sorry, my handwriting is uh, really bad today. Sorry, plus I K2. Oh, that K looks bad. Okay, so now evaluate that and see what you get. And again, that's a homework, so I, I, I you didn't see that. Okay, so anyway, I've already said the, the, the percent reflection will be the number one, which is 100%. Okay, so big picture. If the energy is less than the potential step, then the wave will just bounce off of it. And you saw that in the little video. Uh, a little bit of that red wave penetrated, but it looks like it kind of got quashed over time. All right, so everything, this all kind of makes sense. Okay, now this is a little bit of a funky one, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. If, um, if the energy is equal to the potential energy, that's a weird one. Uh, I just want to cover all my bases. Normally people don't bring this up, but let me show you what that looks like. Um, I think the reflection is still 100%. I'm pretty sure it is. But this is a really weird one, uh, and I have to think about it. I'm going to have to draw this backward, by the way, and you'll see why. It looks like this. You see, it just, it smoothly just flattens out at zero. So, uh, this kind of makes sense because it's almost ready to penetrate, but it can't. So there's still none of the wave, none of the wave is out here. Um, and just a little bit more, it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna be able to get through. But as it stands, with E equals to V, you can, well, actually what happens is here, I can be more explicit. Um, you, can, you can figure out that K2 is zero. Right, if you, if you, if you see right here, if, if the energy and V0 are the same, then K2 is zero. And that means that you have an infinitely long wavelength. Remember that the k's are 2 pi over the de Broglie wavelength. And so the way to make 1 over the wavelength zero, 0 is to have the wavelength be infinitely long. An infinitely long wave is just a straight line. So that's why I drew it this way. Now, I connected it the way I did because it has to be smooth and continuous. So that's a lot of detail. And I don't expect you to, to be able to like know that or do that like I did. I've been doing this 20 years. That's how I knew how to do that, really. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make sure that I covered all my bases. Uh, now, let's do if E is greater than B0. OK, now, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, in this case, uh, what you're going to have is, is this. Did I not give myself enough room? Okay, I've, I've done this. this. This is the thing you've seen me do a bunch of times, actually. Uh, remember when I draw like a wavy, 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 wave, and I say, oh, now it's less wavy, it's less wavy because there's potential energy. The same thing you've heard me drone on and on and on many times now. The, the particle in the finite box with the unbound, yeah, unbound case, right? Same deal. Okay, so I, again, I hope that this is familiar. But there is a catch. Right? There's a catch to this. Not, not this part here. Let me draw the percent reflection as a function of energy. I'm going to incorporate everything that we just did. So I'm going to put E over V naught will be my 
will be my x-axis. So, and the reason I'm doing that is that it's not, you don't have to have any specific potential step or energy or, or any of this. This is just, it's just generic for any, any energy versus any potential. Percent reflection is 1.0. We, we've already covered that. That means 100%. It's 1.0 if the energy is less than the potential step. So we, we've talked about that. So that looks like this. Of course, the percent transmission would be uh, zero. So um, um, I'll, I'll draw that. I'll draw that second. Um, the percent transmission, of course, is one minus the percent reflection. Uh, hopefully, that's obvious. Okay. Now this is where it gets funky. Classically, what would happen? Now, when I say classically, I mean like I'm describing a car. Classically, if you have enough energy to go over the barrier, you do. It's like a bird flying over a wall. If it's one inch higher than the wall, it's over. No problem. It could be two inches, three inches, it doesn't matter. If it's got enough energy to get over the wall, it doesn't. And so that means that you wouldn't have any reflection. So this is what you would expect classically. So I'll do that with like a thinner line. And I'll label that. And I know that's like a really high pollutant word, isn't it? Classical way. I don't know why they picked that word. Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton means classical. That's, uh, again, the bird goes over the wall. It, it, if it clears the wall, it clears the wall. Now, here's what the quantum wave does it, from, from my formula for percent reflection. It does something way different. It doesn't necessarily go straight to zero. And the percent transmission, now I'll do that one, and I'll do that in a solid line so that it won't get confusing. That's just a reflection because it's one minus the percent R, percent uh, reflection, so that's the percent transmission. Percent transmission is a little bit easier to think about. What you're seeing is, if the bird has enough, um, enough altitude to clear the wall, it might bounce off it anyway. So seriously, think about that. A bird flies over the wall. That's what you expect. But actually, unless it clears the wall with a decent amount of height, it bounces off it anyway, despite the fact that it doesn't actually hit the wall. Seriously, the bird, you know, if the bird hits the wall, the bird hits the wall. But a quantum bird, if it just crests over it, it actually is still going to bounce off as though it hit it, even though it didn't. Ah! <laughs> now, you may be thinking like, oh, I can explain that with some kind of analogy, like when a fish goes up the river. Actually, I can't, unless my analogy is a fish goes up the river and then it implodes on itself to the quantum world and becomes Jesus. I mean, there is no analogy. There's no sensible analogy for this. I can't explain this at all other than to do what I just did. So again, the bird has enough height to clear the wall, but, but it actually bounces off. It bounces off it anyway. So that's a really strange thing. Uh, another analogy, this is the one I usually like to do. Um, so there's a wall, and here's a character um, throwing a ball, and um, you know it's like handball, right? And the ball should crest it, but now again, it just bounces off of it as though, as though it hit something even though it didn't. So crazy that. We actually see this kind of phenomenon all the time. Because we study electrons and, and other lighter things, and light things are very quantum mechanical. Now, I can give you some examples, but you know what? There's a better model we have than this. And that model, which is the finite step, so this is the infinite step problem. There's another problem called the um, finite step problem, which has a lot of analogies. And so let me introduce that problem, and then I'm going to tell you the real-world examples of that. And yes, I have another cool video that took me for freaking ever to make. So with that, um, so this is really all I've got on the, five, on the infinite step. Remember that, don't worry about this, but if you ever hear this word, this is called scattering. This is called quantum scattering. Don't worry about that. I just want you to know that's the word that's used. And you'll have some homework problems on this. 
This is like a big deal example. I'll probably have something like this on the next test. Really similar. You have really similar questions on your homework on this. So uh, in that, in terms of the homework, that is when you do this part, right? The uh, set the derivative equal to the other, you know, on, on left and right, and divided by the wave function itself, right? That's uh, can, um, that's smooth divided by continuous. So so remember that. Okay, now let me uh, let me let me wipe out the board. Give me just a few minutes to wipe out the board, and then we're going to do the next problem, which is the finite step problem. All right, I'll be right back. All right, everyone, I'm back. So, next model problem is finite step or finite. Let me give it a different name. Call it the finite barrier. Okay, and you know, this is pretty straightforward. I will draw, hopefully you've probably already figured it out, right? So x goes infinitely left and right, and there is a barrier that is not high. Right? Now, just like the infinite step, oh here, let me let me actually wipe that out. I don't want to, I don't want to get too confusing. Let's let's have Regions one, two, and region three. And just like the infinite step, we have to have a setup, which is the great turkey created this universe, one dimensional with a single electron, picked it up and tossed it, tossed it at the barrier. Like the infinite step, we'll figure out whether it gets through. So we'll, we'll figure out the reflection or transmission. And, um, 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 what else can we do? Um, well, that's really all, all there is to it. The setup, though, is the same. So we're going to have an A wave and a B wave. So um, I actually don't have enough room. This, unfortunately, gets kind of complicated. So we're going to have uh, right, an A wave and a B wave. So, so it'll hit the thing. Okay, and of course it might reflect. Okay, so that's the B wave. Uh, now notice that it has K1, and K1 of course is uh, 2ME over x bar squared. Again, all of this is the same. I, I feel like an idiot writing all this down again because hopefully you know what all this is. Okay, now region two. Okay, so here's the A wave and it's gonna it's gonna come through it. Let's just say it's gonna like decay. This gets kind of interesting. Okay, let's do the obvious A, B, C. All right, so we have a C wave. And now K2. It's going to have a different K, a different wavelength, oh, K1, K2. And of course, that's because the potential step is V naught high. So the De Broglie wavelength is, is uh, longer. So did I say shorter before? It's a, it's a longer De Broglie wavelength. So K2, one over a bigger number means K2 is smaller. OK, that all makes sense. Okay, now this is cool. This is one of the neater things I know. Now watch this. If A hits it and reflects, that's why there's a B wave. Of course, it might also go through. That's a C wave. And this is one of the coolest things I know. The first reflection is on the first, on the like front of the barrier, but when the wave gets through, the back end is actually like a barrier, even though it's the absence of a barrier, right? We go from being in a barrier to not being in a barrier. That change causes a reflection, which is a really strange thing, right? I mean, I totally get when you hit the wall, you might bounce off of it. But when you get through it and then you come out the other side, that there would be a second reflection event is strange to me. But it's true. Let me just write that down. So I've got d e to the i k to x o minus, right? And so I'll have to do a little, I'll have to do a little wave there. 
And then, of course, we'll do region three in a moment. But let me explain why that is. Now, for one, I can just say, well, look, there is, all right? So, blah. But there is an analogy. There is an example of this that you've seen before. Okay, you're walking down the street, and there's a cool car. Brand new, black. And you go up and look into it. Look, you look at it, right? What do you see? You see a little bit of your reflection, right? Now, hold on one second. Black, especially a new car, is, you know, fresh paint. That is like a perfectly good paint job. I mean, that car is like $100,000. You bet that paint's perfect. Black paint absorbs a light. So how can you see your reflection? Do you ever think about that? It, it's not that there's some weird coating on them that, that does actually help, but it turns out that you're seeing that phenomenon right there. Light ought to hit it and be eaten up, so there shouldn't be any reflection. That's what it means for something to be black. But yet, you know that when you go into some really nice fresh paint that's nice and smooth, you know you actually can see your reflection in it. it you can't stop that. And that's what that is. So, as much as this is weird, like you go through the barrier and then all of a sudden the absence of the barrier instigates a reflection, you also know that you can see your reflection in something that's painted jet black. And that's, that's basically the same thing. So, anyway, there's a, there's a backscatter wave in, the, uh, in Region 2. Okay, now Region 3, Region 3 will be easy. Okay, if it does get through, um, it will have less amplitude. It would actually have the same K. It will be K1 on A, B, C, D, E. Okay, it's an E wave. I have to think about that. Uh, it will only go forward. Same, same kind of rules as the last game we played. If it goes through and there's no other barriers, there's no reason for it to reflect. So if, if we get through the barrier, off the two reflect, you know, we have two reflections that, that can occur. If it does get through, it will keep moving to the right. So I don't have any reason for like an F wave. Okay, and, and again, uh, region, you've seen this before. The same K in uh, K1 in region one is the same as in region uh, three, and that's because neither of them have any potential energy. Now, the energy, what, one thing I've seen, okay, here, here's a way to lose points. Let's say I, that I have this on the test and I just ask you to describe it. Some people have said, well, there's one energy in here, one energy here, and a different energy here. No, there's only one energy. In quantum, when we're solving uh, these wave functions, you can, you can assign a wave function an energy, right? You apply the Hamiltonian to the wave function and outspits an energy. Now the wave function is actually the sum of all these. And that works because we're going to make sure that they're smooth and continuous. We have to do that because it's one wave function. And therefore there's only one energy. Now what does vary is the wavelength. Now it's going to have one wavelength in regions one and three and a different, a longer wavelength in region two. That varies, but the wave function itself goes all over. The wave function is smooth and continuous from the left to minus infinity to the right minus infinity. So once I write down a wave function that's smooth and continuous, I can plug it into the Hamiltonian and get the energy. There's only one energy. Right? So anyway, next thing, smooth and continuous. How do we do that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what you've got, and big surprise, we're not going to solve this. You've got two boundaries. You've got two boundary conditions, right? So we've got x equals you know, x, uh, x at 0 and x at L. And you've got to make wave function 1 and 2 smooth and continuous at x equals 0. You've got to make wave function 2 and wave function 3 smooth and continuous at x equals L. You've got your log you know, derivative over the, the wave function, your, your log derivative. What does that turn into? An algebraic nightmare. Now that is done just like the finite box. I have done that. It's on a handout. Even though this is kind of like the finite box but turned over, I believe it's four pages of algebra. There are four pages of algebra on that one. 
So I am not remotely going to do that here. I couldn't. It would take me over an entire class period to do that one. So, um, so if you want to see the algebra on that one, you look at the handout. It's almost impossible to follow. What am I doing on that handout? What am I calculating? What I'm calculating is the percent transmission. Percent transmission. And here I can see that that would be the amplitude of the transmitted wave divided by the amplitude of the incoming wave, like last time. And you put that on a test, right? Let's just say I asked that. And you will get half credit. What did you do wrong? You forgot. Absolute value squared. Okay, so on the handout I saw the uh, amplitude of E over A and the absolute value, I plot that. Okay, two last things and we're going to end there. Let me show you a video. <laughs> All right. Now, again, like last time, I bet that this is kind of, kind of ridiculous to, to look at this and say, like, what, what the heck is going on? All right, so video time. Oh, sorry, everyone, a little problem with the video getting started. Okay, so as I said, uh, we're going to watch a little video of, we're going to have the same type of particle in the box wave designed to move to the right. It's going to hit a, a finite barrier. So you know, I'm going to have to watch that over here while that starts over there. Uh, so what you're seeing here again is uh, on top, you're seeing a, a two wave functions. They're actually identical. I just displaced the top one relative to the bottom one so that their barriers line up on the right. Uh, the waves are actually identical. They have the same energy and they're both going to move to the right. As you can see, the lesson here is that I'm going to have one hit a barrier, uh, the top one, that's about 10 times wider than the smaller one in blue on the bottom. Okay, so let's, let's watch that. Let me get that going over here. And of course, I've got it going over here. And uh, once again, you see the y-axis. I, I know it looks a little funky because I'm scaling it. The wave function widens as it moves to the right because I am less certain where the particle is as it moves to the right because some of the waves that compose the particle in the box have high K and some have low K. You may recall that when we talked about the particle in the box and how it's composed of a sum of, of momentum waves. Okay, so now you're seeing the blue one has hit and it's going through the thin barrier and it's going through very efficiently and the red one less so, which makes sense. The blue barrier is way thinner. In fact, you can see that it's about halfway through, and clearly a lot more of the blue wave is going through than the red wave, which makes sense. But, you know, it'd be funny, I would think that the red wave would be, like, less, less by a factor of 10. And it actually doesn't look that different. In fact, in fact, at this point, it really doesn't look any different at all. In fact, you know, so the thing is, is that the blue wave is done. The, the wave that hit the barrier has now bounced off, and so the, the bottom wave is done it's done transmitting, but the top guy is still spinning out. It's still it's still getting through the barrier. So you know what? Yeah, this is I, I set this up on purpose, right? Here's the deal. It's almost done now. The wider barrier, now that it's almost done, hopefully you can see that actually more of the wave function comes through. I know it looked different at first. It looked like more of the uh, blue wave was going to come through, and early on that was true, but the red wave actually, by the time the simulation was done, more of it came through the barrier, despite the fact that the barrier was 10 times wider. Now that's really bizarre, isn't it? But that's quantum mechanics for you. All right? Now that's called a resonance. That's called a resonance effect. Okay, now let's look at some different data here. Here you see percent transmission is a function of energy over the potential. And uh, you can see that there's, of course, uh, if the energy is lower than the potential energy, um, that it, it, uh, the, the percent transmission rises and it hits one, but then you see those oscillations. Okay, now those are, again, those are called resonances. So what's happening is, is that it turns out that, in the, take the top case, the red case, the red wave case, it turns out that the particle is getting trapped inside of that barrier region. And because it gets trapped, it's more likely to leak out to the right in, in transmit than the blue wave, which was not able to become trapped inside the barrier. So that's why you're able to see a higher percent transmission, even though the barrier is way harder to get through. And so that, that's really counterintuitive. Now, you may notice another thing. You may notice that in, in this case, you see that the percent transmission 
there can be some transmission even if the energy is less than the potential, unlike the infinite barrier. What is that called? That is called um, a tunneling. Okay, so that, that bit where the percent transmission is small but, but non-zero, if the energy is, is less than the potential energy, it can still get through despite that. That's called tunneling. And that's a phenomenon that we see all the time happening in chemistry. It ends up being way important in biochemistry. Because remember, things that behave quantum mechanically include protons. Protons are in water. And water is very important in biology, obviously, for like protein structure. It basically means that protons can move around. They, they can behave like the solution is at a different pH because they can tunnel through barriers. It's like there's more protons than there should be. It's like the solution is more acidic than you think it is, than what your pH strip measures. And that's because protons can tunnel through barriers that normally you, you don't think that they should. Okay, now with that said, I'm almost out of time. I just want to give you some other examples of tunneling. So tunneling, up, okay, that's gone. Tunneling is when, for like a chemical reaction, let's, uh, let's put down a reaction coordinate. And we have uh, reactants. We have products over here. And what we draw is a potential energy surface that kind of looks like this. There we go. Now, normally what you have to do is you have to have enough thermal energy to get over a barrier, right? So your, your product, your quantum mechanical product, has to get, have some temperature to get over the barrier. But tunneling says that no, no, no. Uh, for the most part, that is true, but tunneling allows you to go right through. So you can just form products immediately without any temperature at all. In fact, the way that you know that this is happening, when you set up a chemical reaction, what you do is you find products even when it's cooled down to basically zero. You always find the same amount of products, really no matter what the temperature is, when of course you're very cold. Otherwise, you'll just jump over the barrier like normal. Okay, so that's an example of quantum mechanical tunneling. Other than the water example I, I just gave, um, it's found in organic chemistry here. Let me give you, um, let me give you an example of that. Uh, that is, and I don't really know what I'm talking about, by the way. I do, uh, I'm kind of a synthetic inorganic chemist, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself. I might have to edit this. I think this is called a carbene, I think. Again, I, I shouldn't just say anything. Uh, what's happened here is you can see that a proton, a proton has tunneled over uh, to that, that carbon right there. And it really, that, that is a tremendous amount of energy for a CH bond to break. Yet even at low temperature, if you can see this rearrangement, and that has to be due to tunneling. One last example for biology. I think it probably have gone over time. Sorry about that. I mean, um, hopefully I'll make up for that because, you know, sometimes I... I have gone under time, but I haven't been nearly as good about going. Sometimes I go over time. Okay, so here we have an alcohol, and what it can do is it reacts with NAD+, which is going to oxidize it. And you, you need to oxidize alcohols. Uh, that's what keeps you alive. It's one of the mechanisms by which you process uh, chemicals that you put in your body. Sorry, chemicals that you unfortunately put in your body. Uh, let me, uh, let's see here. I, uh, I'm not very familiar with this stuff. Okay, so what happens is uh, this proton goes here, and then this bond comes out here, and what you end up with is, so if you ever, um, get confused about what's happening, that's oxidation. This is how I remember this. You formed more oxygen bonds, so that's oxidation. That's how you remember that. And then the, the product, of course, is on the biology side is, uh, is NADH. So you start with NADH plus, and here's your, here's your two hydrogens. Your bonding has changed. Oh, sorry, I forgot a little, little two there. Okay. So again, this is terribly important in biology. This is how you uh, how you oxidize alcohol so that you can flush them out of your system. And this is also technically a tunneling event. So very, very important to keep you alive. Okay, I know I went over. Sorry about that. So I'm going to shut up there. 
Uh, next time, next lecture, we're going to do vibrational quantum mechanics, and I have a cool video for that one too uh, that I spent like an entire day on. So, and I think it's Wednesday, so I will see you all on Friday.